could find such a love at our age. Whoever thought we could dance Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I'm your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Well, hello, Judy, and hello, viewers and listeners. Judy, tell people the title of today's mm. podcast. Betrayal and Forgiveness. Betrayal and Forgiveness. Now, those of you who've been following us for a while have probably, well, if you've been listening to our podcast for a while, mm -hmm. you've been hearing us talk about the fact that I've been working on a book mm -hmm. called, by golly, Betrayal, Betrayal and, and Forgiveness. forgiveness. Yes, yes. The, the subtitle is, what is the, what is the subtitle? <laughs> the subtitle is, How to Navigate the Turmoil and Learn to Trust Again. That's mm -hmm. the subtitle. I was <laughs> just had to call well, it for memory. It's been changed several times. It has been why. changed so along the way, yes. And look, it, it still could change. And it still might change. Because right? it is, but it is in a very, at least for me, a very exciting time because I've finished a draft and you've gone over it and, you know, mm -hmm. done, done a, an editing. Yes. And uh, we... It's being looked at by a number of readers right now, yep. and um, I'm just really excited about it. And so what, what I wanted to do today, uh, particularly because we thought we had a guest and the guest hasn't materialized, right, no <laughs> so, so we're going to seize the opportunity, by golly, uh, by golly uh, and we're going to uh, talk about that book and talk about, you know, it's it's a hot topic. Everybody keeps telling me it's a hot topic. Yeah, yeah. Well, look at it. you live long enough, even if you live short enough. Everybody's either experienced betrayal or betrayed somebody. You know, there's betrayal in your life. There's betrayal in your life, yeah. And, you know, most of us have probably done both to some extent. Sure. And I realize, you know, and I, actually one of the things I talk about in the book is when I say betrayal, I'm not talking about something trivial. You know, mm -hmm. I'm talking about something that is, you know, a major league, you know, cheating on someone or... Um, you know, major financial malfeasance of some kind, you know, yeah, you know somebody like keeps telling se yeah. a secret on somebody that can potentially ruin their lives or relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to give folks an outline of what's in the book just to whet their appetite. And in along the way, I wanna, we can talk a little bit about you know why why is this such a hot topic i mean okay. aside from what you've already said which is it's so common yeah and i will simply add the obvious it's incredibly painful mm -hmm. and many people have told me when well of course a lot of people come to see me as a therapist in the midst of having been betrayed in the midst of that turmoil that that subtitle refers to mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are looking for ways to, first of all, just to plain feel better because it's so awful, that feeling of betrayal. And they're also looking for ways of, you know, preventing it. And even when you're over the initial shock, they're looking for ways of, as the, as the subtitle says, learning how to trust again. Yeah. And you notice I, I, a subtle omission in the subtitle. I didn't say learning how to trust the person who betrayed you again. Right. I said learning how to trust again. Because you might not be able to trust the person who betrayed you again, or then again, maybe you can, and that is a lot of what I talk about in the book. So I thought what would be, um, I hope, of interest to folks is I'm just going to kind of step through the, the contents of the book, yeah, and we'll touch on some of the topics and uh, you know give you a sense of why I laid it out the way I laid it out. So uh, what I did in the book was I introduced... 12 couples, mm -hmm. uh, a nice dozen, <laughs> it turned out to be 12, I didn't plan the number in advance. Right. Um, and they're not all, uh, they're not all, you know, like married couples or, uh, you know, romantic couples or something. There's um, at least a couple of people where they're friends or other kinds of relatives or things like that. But they're all an example of two people where one, the other, or both felt badly betrayed by something that mm -hmm. happened. And what kind of betrayals uh, happened? Well, what, what, of course, you've read the book, but I'll, I'll ask you as if you didn't. What would you guess? Well, like you mentioned earlier, infidelity. Yeah, I that's probably that's the... A, that's a big one. Yeah, I mean, in terms Especially of the number... couples therapy. Precisely. Yeah. The, the number of folks that I see in couples therapy, mm -hmm. that is, you know, if I was going to say, what's the biggie in terms of some sort of event that happens between them that brings them to couples therapy... I don't know if it's a majority, but it's certainly a plurality. You yeah. know, it's like a, a big chunk of the folks I see are dealing with infidelity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or even if it's not infidelity, it, it could still be betrayed by your partner in other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what, what comes to mind? Um, let's say that your spouse has a gambling problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and has sucked all your finances and savings yep. out the window. Yep. 
um, I think in the book you have, I think one of the examples and people that we've actually had on the show are uh, people who have found out that their husband is uh, like dressing up in women's clothing. Yes, indeed. That's, uh, I have an example of that where the, where the woman felt very betrayed by not knowing about it yeah. for the entire time of their marriage. And I think they're, in the example in the book, they've been married for like 40 years. Mm -hmm. And she came home early and discovered this and come to find out that he had been doing this in secret and, of course, feeling very ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, that's that turns out to be a big uh, search topic for people that find my website, you yeah. know, that find our blog, find some of our episodes when mm -hmm. we've talked about that. Yeah, cross-dressing. Yeah, certainly uh, I, I have an example of best friends, two women who were best friends and business partners, mm -hmm. where the woman who was in charge of the finances drops the ball, uh, fails to file their the corporate taxes for what is a growing company for several years, and the other woman only finds out about it because the IRS puts a lien on their houses. Yeah. And yeah. uh, she feels horribly betrayed. And that's, you know, that's not that unusual. Mm -hmm. We have an example, or I, I put an example in there, and it's interesting because I heard about this from several different people. Um, and in fact, we had a podcast guest talking about being disinherited right. by her father. Right. And so there is a um, there's a couple in the book, and it, it's in the book. It's a couple who are dealing with the fact that the woman was disinherited by her father. And the story in the book, which is different from our podcast guest, the story in our in the book is that the woman had no idea why she was disinherited, but right. the only thing she could think of was that her husband and her father never got along, and this mm -hmm. brought up a bunch of you know, largely suppressed issues in their marriage right. for a long time. Sure. So there is that. Yeah, well, oftentimes when there's betrayal, other issues seem to uh, come out. Absolutely. In the mix. Well, of course, that is sometimes, not always, but mm -hmm. sometimes the backdrop, you know, the context of the betrayal. It's fascinating with infidelity because I never tell anybody, and nor should I ever tell anybody, oh, it's your fault that your husband, wife, partner cheated on you. Right. No, if somebody's cheated and they know, you know, it's they've stepped outside the rules and they know perfectly well that they're stepping outside the rules, that's their responsibility, not the responsibility of the other person. Having said that, if you don't look at the context of the relationship where that occurred, you're not going to learn what you need to learn. Even if you split up from the person, you're not going to yeah. learn what you need to learn. And if you want to stay together... You definitely need to look at that. You know, why wouldn't somebody have said, oh, I'm thinking of, I'm feeling attraction to someone else. Why wouldn't somebody have brought that up? Partly because they're just terrified mm -hmm. at the notion. They're hoping it'll go away or whatever. Partly because they're worried at the reaction they're going to get. And sometimes the context of that is the couple has had a hard time talking about hard stuff yeah. for a very long time. So, you know, that's when they can process that, if their marriage or their, their partnership is going to survive, it'll only survive by being better than it was. And I do have some of what I think of as inspiring stories mm. uh, in this book of couples that they ended up much better off than they were before. You know, so they not only could restore trust with each other, but they had a better relationship than they had before. They were grateful for having gone through it. Yeah. And that, that always is a, it lifts my heart when I encounter that. Now, this isn't in your book, mm -hmm. and we haven't even talked about this, but mm -hmm. I, was on, I was listening to the radio today, and they were talking about how more siblings are seeking out couples therapy because there's a lot of um, rifts in sibling relationships oh, these days. Well, actually, I, you may not remember, since it's been... A couple of weeks since you read the book, but I do have a couple of the, in that. One of the uh, one of the couples I have in my book are a brother and a sister. And Which one was that? <laughs> oh, you're expecting me to remember their names? <laughs> no, book. don't give me names. What was the situation? <laughs> the situation was. Oh, that was the disinherited thing. No, no, oh, no, no. It was a different one. Oh. The the brother had ratted out the sister for cheating oh, right, on her right, boyfriend. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, yeah. we're hoping, folks, that the, <laughs> here we are in our little in talk here, hoping this is whetting your appetite for the book. Yeah. The the uh, well, again, all of these things. I should I should mention this for this, especially for the sake of any of my former clients uh, or yeah. current clients that are hearing this. Yeah. All of these couples. Are the identifying details have been thoroughly changed? Uh -huh. Some of them are, you know, composites. That's the way one does this, so that 
you know, if you have a similar story and you've seen me, this is not you, yeah. but it is. Well, it's like we said about the, the woman we had on, on our uh, show who had been disinherited. And I actually wrote to her yeah. and I said, you know, you will see in this book, uh -huh. there is something there, but this isn't obviously not exactly Well, you know, you. it's funny because, you know, that story happened to a friend, you know, very close story is similar. Yes, so, yes like, indeed. And it happens. And I, another friend of mine, the I don't want to go into details, <laughs> but this is like two people that I know that very similar things have happened yeah, to. Yeah. So it really isn't all that unusual. No, it isn't at all. And of course, that's the whole point. All yeah. of my examples are, that's the thing. I, it, it's to create these composites. It's mm -hmm. not that hard because, you know, I can I can come up with characters without worrying about identifying folks because I can mix together a number of different people. Pretty much all of these situations, is that true? Maybe not all of them, but most of the situations mm -hmm. I've encountered multiple times. Yeah. So that's in the book, that the uh, situation of uh, uh, brother and sister. And I also have a section, uh, the long-term listeners to us uh, will perhaps remember way back early in our podcast, I forgot what number it was, but it was one of the early uh episodes we did was with Carl Pilmer. Oh yeah, the yeah. Uh, Cornell lines, professor. Right? Yeah, Fault Lines, that's the name of his book. Yeah, good book. A very good book. And, and, he was and a great guest. He was a great guest. Yeah, yeah check out that that uh, episode. It's one of our earlier episodes. If you scroll back uh, when you see a list of our episodes, you'll see it. It's I don't know, numbers 1920 somewhere in there. I don't mm -hmm. remember what it was. But I re-listened to it recently just, you know, because I include uh, some uh, some of his ideas, and you know, I, I cite him in the book. Yeah. Um, and he talks a lot about that phenomenon of family rifts and how incredibly painful it is. And they are often brought about by somebody feeling betrayed. Yeah. That's usually or often what is happening. So I discuss all of that, and you know, what I I introduce all these couples, and that's the that's chapter one. And then I talk about all right, what is betrayal? You know, there's all kinds of ways people can hurt each other that isn't betrayal. So what, how do you separate, well, let me ask you, mm -hmm. how do you define betrayal in this sense then, as yeah. opposed to just being lousy, nasty, or horrible to somebody else? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because sometimes one morphs into the other. Mm -hmm. Betrayal is, of course, when somebody does something that you experience as bad, you know, they hurt you some mm -hmm. way, when you didn't expect it of them based on your relationship with them. That's the key. Betrayal is always relative to expectation. You know... A, a stranger can hurt you and do horrible things to you and make you feel terrible, mm -hmm. but a stranger can't betray you. You have no relationship. Only someone with whom you have a relationship can betray you. Now, you could say a stranger in the sense of, you know, if somebody on your side of a, of a war, you know, uh, commits sabotage against your side, that's a sort of betrayal of the cause. Yeah. But in terms of a personal betrayal, it has to be based on the, the particular relationship. And, you know, a simple example of this if you're a married couple or a uh, you know a monogamous couple, if your agreement with each other is monogamy and somebody mm -hmm. has sex with somebody else willingly, that's obviously a betrayal of that expectation. Right. If you are not married or you know if it's not a sexual relationship, you know your friends don't owe you um, sexual exclusivity. <laughs> you know the people with whom you you are not having sex can have sex with anybody you want to. You may think it's wise, you may think it's unwise, but they're not betraying you if they have sex with someone else. Mm -hmm. So. It's always about expectation. And one of the things I do, actually, I have a chapter called, Are You Sure It's Really Betrayal? Not because I'm saying, oh, you know, it's you shouldn't be so hurt. I, I encountered that. Actually, just the other day, I met a couple where some of what they're wrestling with is the woman feels like whenever she tells the man she's bothered by something, he's all about, well, you have to learn how to take care of yourself about that. Uh -huh. He has no, you know, the, her, her feeling is he has no empathy toward uh -huh. her. That's not, you know, I'm, I'm talking about situations where you have an expectation in the relationship and it's sometimes worth looking at. And I'll give you one of the examples from the book where a couple came to see me where they were both saying, yeah, he's a sex addict. Mm -hmm. The guy's a sex addict. I, what do I call them in, in my book? I think Patricia and Zach, is that what I call them? All these names are, are made up names, folks. If there's any Patricias or Zachs out there, it is clearly <laughs> not, not you. <laughs> it couldn't be you. <laughs> Anyway, the point being, that's, I think that's what I call them. Uh -huh. So, yeah, it's funny. You know, I made up the names so as to make sure that 
they I, I arranged them all in alphabetical order by woman's name so that mm -hmm. people could go back to that chapter and uh -huh. look up their backstories easily. Anyway, so Patricia and Zach come up and they're both saying, yep, Zach's a sex addict. Why is Zach a sex addict? Well, because Patricia came home, again, the, the standard story, came home early, you know, unexpectedly, <laughs> discovers him and he's masturbating to porn. Mm. And she's disgusted by the porn and yeah. she's disgusted by the masturbation. She uh -huh. thinks that's cheating. Uh -huh. She thinks both of those things are cheating. And he doesn't know what to do about this. He's really upset. He didn't. He was keeping the secret from her because he knew perfectly well she disapproved. Right. So he kept and it. And she would react that and way. And she would react she that way. Out. So you know that was true. Well, and should but, have locked the door better. <laughs> you you could say double, that. Put the double bolt on. But but of course the problem was he didn't. Yeah. So the point being. They could, you know, they could sit with that, and their their initial presentation was, "Oh, he's a sex addict." Well, we talked about it, and by not freaking out about it, and and I I note in the book, by the way, it is not my job, it is not my orientation to tell people that they're wrong about how they feel. You know, there are lots of therapists who would who would engage in what they like to call psychoeducation. It's like, oh, come on. Everybody masturbates, or almost everybody masturbates, not everybody, almost everybody masturbates. There's all kinds of, you know, research on that. And it's healthy, it's fine, you know, you shouldn't think of that as, you know, something horrible, whatever. I don't say that to people. I inquire into their meanings around it. And in the course of inquiring into the meanings around this, came to find out that Patricia actually, it's not that she was so upset by his masturbating per se. She thought she was, but when she really thought about it, she was saying, no, that's not what gets to me. What gets to me is he's thinking about someone else. That's why the porn bothered him. Uh, he's thinking about someone else. And, and well, <laughs> I, I turn to the expert on women in our conversation right now. I hear that sort of thing from women all the time, right? Uh, a lot of women's difficulty with men's use of porn, yeah. leave aside all the, you know, the social issues about is it, is it okay or not okay you know, to create it. But a lot of it I hear from women is, oh, my God, I can't compete with that. Mm -hmm. It's like... I don't, you know, he's looking, he's getting turned on by someone who doesn't look like me. Right. And that feels like cheating. Yeah. And it feels very threatening. Mm -hmm. And when they were able to talk about that, they were, it turned to, well, you know, because he, of course, like most men in that situation, is protesting, oh my God, no, I desire you. I, it's, it's just that, no, I get, I've been turned on by images like that since I was a kid. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way it works for most men. Mm-hmm. And, you know, most, again, the, most men are visually oriented that way and are turned on by sexy images for whatever their sort of individual they're interested in. So when they were able to talk about it, they actually got into a discussion of their actual relationship. And as soon as they did that, she didn't, she started not feeling like, oh, I guess it really wasn't betrayal. It was troublesome. Uh -huh. But it wasn't, it was troublesome. He was keeping a secret. Yeah. It was, and then they started talking about their sex life. And things got a lot better uh -huh. a little spoiler alert there folks i will i'll jump to the end here for a second the last <laughs> chapter of the book i say what happened to the couples mm -hmm. so that you're not left hanging on that uh -huh. you know so you, you see what what happened to them all anyway so that's you know i we ask about it are you sure you have to think of it as betrayal and mm -hmm. if you can re-examine your expectations maybe it's not betrayal but what if it is okay what if it is well then you're dealing with a situation where you're feeling angry and hurt and often afraid because you're worried you might be losing an important relationship and losing support and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. How do you proceed? Well, that's when I start talking about the concept of forgiveness. And the point of view I take on forgiveness, and if those of you who've read my other books, especially uh, Reigniting the Spark, my, the first book that came out a few years ago, will know I adopt the principle. I, I didn't use this phrase until recently because I heard it from one of our podcast guests, actually, who didn't make it up either, by the way. Uh, forgiveness is an inside job. Uh -huh. That notion that forgiveness isn't, you don't need the other person to, to deserve forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You don't need to trust them to forgive them. You certainly aren't minimizing what they did to forgive them. You can forgive somebody and still sue them. You right. can forgive somebody and still divorce them. You can forgive somebody and still go to war against them. But forgiveness is about letting go of the anger yourself so that you can not be so oppressed by it. And I, I quote a very well-known quote from Anne Lamott, which I just love, uh, which is what she said is, to not forgive someone is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. Yeah. 
and it's getting the poison out of you so you can then you can deal with the rat yeah so i talk a lot about how do you go about forgiving and i've got like a whole bunch of chapters of you know what is forgiveness why should you forgive why you shouldn't forgive mm -hmm. there are circumstances when you need the anger because that anger is there for good reason you can't just suppress it you can't just dismiss it you need to actually work with it and so you may not be ready to forgive nobody else can tell you when you're ready to forgive yeah. i have a section on that and then I talk about, all right, how can you forgive? How do you manage to do that? Do you want to get into that now, or do you want to uh, wait for a later episode? Or you know, let me and not spill all the beans. I don't want to spill all the beans. <laughs> I want to give folks just a little teaser outline. Uh -huh. that. That's you know, uh, because I, I actually have this in much shorter in the book, reigniting the spark, and uh -huh. I go into much more detail yeah. than this. It's a three-step process, and I call the three steps: forgive yourself, mm -hmm. forgive those who hurt you, mm -hmm. and forgive God yeah. which is like uh oh whoa <laughs> all of you folks who are out there thinking oh no G into this, these are, are <laughs> these are religious fanatics no we're not in fact I have a whole section on how where you know because I, I say well where do I stand in this whole God business and I say pretty much any place except fundamentalist I am not Fun, well, I'm, I'm sort of anti-fundamentalist, though I hate to be anti-anything. But the, the whole point is, no, if you're coming at it from a fundamentalist perspective that says you know for sure exactly what God means and says, and it's it's written down here, and there's no other way to interpret it than the right way. And right. Well, some people will tell you that. Some people, many people will tell you that. I have sat in rooms with people who have told me that. As, as have I, <laughs> many times. Uh, and sometimes they visited our doorstep. <laughs> um in any case, uh, no, and, and I have to, I, I want to be careful with that distinction, though, because I have met some very conservative religious folks mm -hmm. who are not fundamentalist in yeah. the way I'm describing. They are very convinced and very dedicated to what their, what their beliefs and their practices are, but they are open to <clears> actually <throat> understanding other folks, and I find that really inspiring. So I'm not, I'm not at all saying, oh, be wishy-washy and have, no, I'm not saying that. Yeah. But I am saying forgive God is, is one of my chapters, and I'll, I'll let that be a teaser because mm -hmm. it, you don't have to be religious to, to wrestle with that. Of course, as Jews, we're all about wrestling with God. That's the, the word Yisrael in, in Hebrew. Or Israel. Israel uh, is derived, well, it's a folk etymology, really, but it is derived in the Bible from the notion of wrestling with God. Yeah. That's what we're doing. So I have a chapter on that as well. And that naturally segues into a discussion of faith because in some ways i claim the concept of being able to forgive god for <laughs> for the world being what it is mm -hmm. you know a world where you get hurt that way yeah um is essentially equivalent to faith as i define it it's that and i've talked about this in all of my books and yeah. many of my podcasts you know many of my videos and our, we've mm -hmm. talked about it you could say what faith is what's my definition of faith not to put you on the spot <laughs> <laughs> faith is uh the belief that the world is right to be what it is. Bingo, yes. It's when you accept the rightness of reality. Absolutely. That's the idea, yeah. And that I, I think that's pretty equivalent to the notion of I can forgive God for making a world in which I get betrayed. Mm -hmm. So that's central yeah. to moving on from betrayal. And I have a section on, all right, how do you move on? Which means, all right, now, now what? Yeah, if, good question. How do you move on? Exactly. And, you know, read your upcoming book. <laughs> read my upcoming book. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the problem, of course, is if you've been able to forgive, which is the sense, you know, if you're past the shock mm -hmm. and past the anger and you're no longer, you know, you're concerned but not terrified, you know, you're hurt but you're not mortally wounded, you know, it's like, okay, now what? Well, the now what is how do you develop trust with someone? Mm. You're not gonna, probably not going to want to stay married to someone or partner with someone that you can't trust. Right. Although I do have, I do mention in the book, there are folks who do not, either don't, eat, don't have the option or don't experience the option of splitting up. Yeah. That they'd rather stay with someone they don't trust than go through divorce. And I, I understand that. So, yeah, how do you get through that? I, I talk about that a bit. Uh, then I talk about how you can actually rebuild trust with a partner that you want to stay with. And at that, of course, you know, I said forgiveness is an inside job, but trust building takes both. Yes. You're both involved in that. Yeah. And then after uh, I talk about that, that's when, let me just <laughs> do, look at my cheat sheet here, my uh, table of contents. Oh yeah, of course. I have a chapter on what if you're the one who did the betraying, oh, which yeah. I think is a very important chapter. And, and I mentioned in the book, 
that's a chapter for everybody, whether or not, even if you've been betrayed, mm -hmm. that's a useful chapter for everybody. And of course, part of that is the question of, should you apologize? Can you apologize? And if you're going to apologize, how can you apologize? Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite sections of that is a section I call apologies, non-apologies, and bullshit. <laughs> And I have my little classifying scheme. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're so sensitive. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's the non-apology. <laughs> right. Well, I might as well say, what, you know, that's the non-apology. That's the the quintessential non-apology. Oh, yeah. Because it's not an apology, mm -hmm. right? The then there's the apology that goes, "Oh my God, I did do that. I'm so sorry. That wasn't me. I mean, it's just you know me better than that. That, mm -hmm. that certainly wasn't me. That's not a non-apology. That's just bullshit. Yeah. Because yes, it was me. <laughs> yes, it was you. <laughs> it wasn't all of me. You know, I'm, I'm sort of appealing at that point saying, well, don't judge me by the worst things I've ever done. Well, that, yeah, don't judge people by the mm -hmm. worst things they've ever done. But, oh, my God, don't duck the fact. Yeah, you know, I shouldn't duck the fact that that was me. I better, I better figure that out. That's right. It, and, you know, maybe it was yeah. the medication you were on, but it was still you. Well, exactly. <laughs> and, look, if it was the medication I was on, I better off. address that. <laughs> That's right. But, but even, you know, it's usually it's not the medication. No, I know. <laughs> you know, I might know. make you more prone to something, but, you know, mm. the same thing. I, oh, I was drinking, so I cheated. Well, well yeah, yeah, but you still cheated, <laughs> you know. Right. But, no, it's the, the, um, the trick there, you know, in terms of the betrayer. I, I, I mentioned this. This is something I almost have never heard, but it's almost. I've heard it oh, a handful of times over 30 years mm -hmm. where somebody who has done some horrible thing, you know, mm -hmm. they've betrayed the person, they've been, you know, they've been abusive, they've been whatever they've been, right. and they're trying to repair the relationship. And I've heard, actually heard people say words to the effect, you know, it was me, and I'm, I'm really sorry, and I got to figure this out, and there's no way I should come back until I do. And when they say that, it's like, Oh my God, that's credible. That's an apology. That, it's not only an apology, well, but it's also, it's like, oh, yeah, oh up that's there. credible. Okay. Yeah, because they're saying, yeah, they shouldn't come back until they do. And in fact, I've had that come up in circumstances where the other person who's, you know, t like terrified about possibly losing their partner or something. Yeah. And they're feeling like, no, no, I want you to come back. And they're saying, oh my God, I, there's no way I should come back and, and do that to you again. That, no, not until I figure this out. Mm -hmm. You know, not until I can, I can promise myself with some degree of credibility and then maybe I can promise you. Yeah. Very, very rarely do people say that. Usually what they say is, I'm so sorry, take me back. Yeah. And of course that, that also turns out to be, that's, that's an apology, but it's ineffective. It's not credible. Well, could you, trust somebody if you they haven't gotten to that other moment precisely yeah yeah so that's um that's an overview of the book and um of course we will let you know <laughs> when it's when it's ready we certainly will and um you will one way you can find out about that is to sign up for dr chalmers newsletter which comes out roughly once a month uh, and you do that right from our website, ctn7.com. That's the number seven. If those of you watching the video will see that floating above, I think my head, not yours, isn't it? That's one of the, oh, no, I, have, I have the QR code and you've got the, I don't remember. Anyway, look at the video, folks. <laughs> You'll see it. That's funny. You think I could turn around and look up there, but that's yeah, not how it works, is it? No, it's not there yet. We, I, I, haven't, I haven't brought in the sign to take the picture of. That's a joke, folks. Mm. It's a <laughs> silly joke. Anyway. Um, so do that and let's while we're on the subject get a hold of my other books right uh reigniting the spark which i just just so happens that i'm i'm uh, negotiating with my publisher to you know re-up mm -hmm. re my contract right. with them and uh, also my more recent book which is it's not about communication why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong exactly so get a hold of that as well and Let's talk about your book, which we will now unapologetically refer to as your book, even though it's a pseudonym. Ah, uh, yes. The Blue Tent, Erotic Tales from the Bible by Laria Zilber. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Lovely er erotic erotica. tales. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Too hot for us to read. Yes, we cannot on this read program. on this podcast. Yes, we have, we have our, uh, what are we rated, um, PG-13 or something. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, because I did say bullshit and something. I was yeah. totally said. 
said fuck, but not a lot. Not you know? a lot. Yeah, you're, I think aren't you allowed on, on uh, various programs, They when they're rating these things, they count the number of times that people drop the F-bomb. Oh, is that how they it's do it? It's something like oh, that. It's, I don't, I don't know. know. We anyway, don't drop that a lot. We don't drop it a lot, yes. Yeah, so we would not read from that but book you do, because... You do go to your oh shit moment a lot. I do the, yeah, the oh shit moment, right. But we do not read steamy erotica on this program no, we don't. much as you would probably enjoy it, folks. And if you would enjoy that, you would get to hear that steamy erotica read by none other than my lovely wife. Yes, so if you want Judy, to get so. the audiobook, you can go to Amazon and you can get the paperback, audiobook, Kindle. All three. All three. <laughs> <laughs> and they make great gifts, too. Yes, they do. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so the other thing we want you to do is tell folks about our, our podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, let yeah. people know and, and rate us and follow us and all that kind of good stuff. And tell, you know, and tell your friends. Tell your friends. And so until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith. Mm -hmm.